My name is Vidya Krishnan. I'm a faculty of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine at Metro Health Medical Center campus in Cleveland, Ohio. I want to talk to you today about the causes of low arterial partial pressures of oxygen. When you are assessing a patient who you suspect has poor oxygenation to the peripheral tissues, one of the first places you would start in assessing the patient is to determine what is the total oxygen delivery. Oxygen delivery is equal to the cardiac output multiplied by the oxygen content of the blood. Oxygen in the blood has two components of its own. First is the oxygen bound to hemoglobin, and the second is the oxygen dissolved in the plasma. As you can see by the numbers, the oxygen bound to hemoglobin represents a larger proportion of the total oxygen content of the blood as compared to the dissolved oxygen. This fact is depicted in this oxyhemoglobin saturation curve. There's a clear association with the oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin and the oxygen that's dissolved. That is, the hemoglobin saturation and the oxygen tension. At higher oxygen tensions, the hemoglobin molecules are saturated with oxygen to the point that it reaches nearly 100% saturation, and any further increases in the oxygen tension does not necessarily change the hemoglobin saturation. The dissolved oxygen represents such a small portion of the total oxygen content that even a difference between an oxygen tension of 100 and 600 results in very little total net increase in the total oxygen content. When oxygen content of the blood is low, that is termed hypoxemia. So the determinants of oxygen delivery include cardiac output, hemoglobin, and the oxygen saturation and partial pressures of oxygen. Low oxygen delivery can be explained by low cardiac output, as you would see in a state like heart failure. Low or abnormal hemoglobin might be seen in a patient who's anemic, who has carbon monoxide poisoning, or met hemoglobinemia, for example. These are conditions to be discussed at another time. What I want to focus on is the causes of low oxygen saturations and partial pressures of oxygen, so low oxygen content. There's five basic causes of low oxygen content. Hypoventilation, shunt, VQ mismatch, diffusion abnormalities, and high altitude. High altitude is generally not a diagnostic dilemma. You basically know when you're at a certain altitude. So I'm gonna focus my discussion on the first four. To distinguish between these different causes of hypoxemia, we start to use the tools we have in pulmonary physiology. Hypoventilation is probably the easiest to identify. On an arterial blood gas, or ABG, you want to look to see, is the arterial CO2 level high? If it is, then the patient has hypoventilation. The real question, though, is, does that increase in CO2 explain the decrease in oxygen? This is where the AA gradient becomes important. The AA gradient, or the alveolar arterial oxygen gradient, represents the difference in partial pressures of oxygen in the alveolus versus the arterial blood. The alveolar partial pressure of oxygen is determined by this equation, the FiO2 multiplied by the atmospheric pressure minus vapor pressure, and subtract from that the arterial CO2 level divided by the respiratory quotient. So the AA gradient is the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen, which you just calculated, minus the arterial partial pressure of oxygen. Please don't forget this last part. We work so hard doing the math, calculating the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. Sometimes we forget to subtract the arterial partial pressure of oxygen to calculate the AA gradient. The normal AA gradient for a young, non-smoking adult is roughly five to 10. We do know that the AA gradient increases with age, so there is some fudge factor that we use to calculate this. One such rule is about the age divided by four plus four should equal the AA gradient for a patient. And we also know that the AA gradient is less reliable with higher FiO2. There is actually a more complicated equation that 
takes into account the FiO2, but for our purposes, just realize with higher FiO2 concentrations, the AA gradient becomes less reliable. So now we've been able to identify hypoventilation. Next, we want to look at what is the response to the hypoxemia when 100% FiO2 is administered. In all of the causes of hypoxemia, except for shunt, we should see a significant increase in the partial pressure of oxygen. So let's look at why. You're going to get really familiar with this very simplistic two alveolus, two capillary model. Let's plug in some normal numbers to see how this works. So as we're breathing room air, the partial pressure of oxygen in room air is about 150 millimeters of mercury, and there's undetectable amounts of carbon dioxide. As this flows down to the alveoli, we have alveolar partial pressures of oxygen around 100, and alveolar carbon dioxide levels of about 40. Venous blood then flows by the alveoli, the gases equilibrate, and we end up with arterial oxygen pressures of about 95 millimeters of mercury, and arterial CO2 levels around 40. And those are the numbers we think of as normal arterial blood gases. If we increased the inspired oxygen to 100% FiO2, that would correlate with a partial pressure of oxygen of roughly 700 millimeters of mercury. That would translate to alveolar partial pressures of roughly 650 millimeters of mercury, with alveolar PCO2 remaining constant at 40. Again, venous gas will pass by the alveoli, gas will equilibrate, but now the oxygen tensions in the arterial blood is significantly increased. What happens in shunt? Shunt is at extreme condition when ventilation is completely cut off, but perfusion remains intact, as depicted in the left alveolus. So as we're breathing room air, normal areas of the lung, as depicted in the right alveolus, have the expected concentrations of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the alveoli, whereas areas of shunt are not exposed to that room air, so can only equilibrate to the venous blood that's running nearby. This venous blood then combines with the newly oxygenated blood for the final admixture. But the partial pressure of oxygen is still low. This is because the resulting partial pressure of oxygen is not just the simple averaging of the partial pressures of oxygen from the two blood sources, but rather it's the average of the oxygen content from these two blood sources. And as I mentioned before, the oxygen-bound hemoglobin component is the largest component of the oxygen content, not the partial pressure of oxygen. This becomes more apparent when we deliver 100% inspired oxygen. The normal areas of the lung, such as the right side of the picture, have the expected increase in partial pressures of oxygen, whereas the area of shunt is not exposed to the inspired gases and only exposed to the venous gases to equilibrate. The resultant admixture of the venous blood and the newly oxygenated blood creates a combination where the partial pressure of oxygen is still low because it's an averaging of the oxygen content from these two blood sources. And you'll notice the oxygen content, even in the normal part of the lung, is not too different than the oxygen content of that normal lung when inspiring room air. So the resulting partial pressure of oxygen isn't too different. The key point here is that oxygen partial pressures are strongly affected by shunt. One of the key sticking points I hear when learning these concepts is what is considered an adequate or inadequate response to breathing in 100% FiO2. And the answer is not so straightforward. It has to do with the amount of blood or percentage of shunt involved in the process. And there are equations to calculate the percentage of shunt based on the arterial blood gases. But this is why you want to observe a patient's arterial blood gases in the extreme conditions of room air and 100% FiO2. So you really get a strong sense of what happens to the arterial oxygen tensions when breathing in a significantly higher amount of oxygen. The second key point is that carbon dioxide levels are not as affected by areas of shunt. This is because the central chemoreceptors are so sensitive to any alterations in arterial CO2 levels that when higher CO2 levels are detected, 
ventilation is increased to maintain a stable arterial CO2 tension. Let's move on to VQ mismatch. In the ideal situation, there's exactly enough ventilation to meet the perfusion needs and the VQ ratio is one. When ventilation is inadequate, the VQ ratio is less than one. And when perfusion is inadequate, the ratio is greater than one. This is the concept of VQ mismatch. There are extreme conditions such as shunt, which we just talked about, where there's absolutely no ventilation to meet the perfusion needs and the completely opposite part of the spectrum where there's ventilation but absolutely no perfusion, which is called dead space. These extreme conditions are really not what we're talking about with VQ mismatch. There needs to be at least some ventilation and some perfusion for this physiology to occur. We can use the simple two alveolar model to understand VQ mismatch as well. On the right side, we have an area of normal ventilation but reduced perfusion, so a VQ ratio of greater than one and on the left side, the opposite. Perfusion is intact, but ventilation is reduced, so a VQ ratio of less than one. When this patient is breathing room air, the alveoli on the right side have gas tensions that are normal or as expected, but on the left side, in the areas of poor ventilation, there's inadequate oxygenation of the alveoli, and the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is reduced compared to normal. Gases then equilibrate with the blood, and the resulting admixture has a low partial pressure of oxygen. The difference, however, is what occurs when 100% FiO2 is administered. As opposed to shunt, VQ mismatch at least has some ventilation intact on that left side. So while alveolar oxygenation is not perfect, we are able to increase the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, and as a result, the equilibration of gases between the alveoli and the blood results in a better oxygenation of the blood. Oxygen content is increased and therefore the admixture of blood results in increases in the partial pressure of oxygen. Diffusion abnormalities is another common cause of hypoxemia. If we have the luxury of time or we have old pulmonary function tests, we may find a low diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide which indicates an impaired diffusion of oxygen as well. However, usually when we are assessing a patient who is hypoxemic, the standard testing includes imaging of the chest, either by chest x-ray or a CT scan, to look for interstitial thickening. This might indicate inflammation or fibrosis, which is impairing the diffusion of oxygen from the alveoli into the blood vessels. So that is my quick summary of causes of hypoxemia. We covered hypoventilation, shunt, VQ mismatch, and touched briefly on diffusion abnormalities and high altitude. One final thought is that no patient is perfect. And so very often we might find that there is a combination of two or more of these causes of hypoxemia in a patient. Don't let that fool you. Thanks.